thanks guys. It's really important to have this conversation today. Uh, it's been a really re difficult week. Uh, the country, many of us black people are reeling from um, a lot of violence that we've seen this week. We're reeling from this pandemic wreaking havoc in our communities. Uh, and we're trying to really understand and heal from uh, the, the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, um, uh, Breonna Taylor, Sean Reed, Nina Pop. And what a lot of folks don't realize is that there are organizers on the ground that are in these communities, um, are being impacted by this trauma and violence and are mobilizing and getting it done and uh, making sure that people are held accountable. So I'm really happy to have this conversation with you guys so that you can share with us all of your strategies, what you're thinking, how you're getting it done. Um, you, I know, and many people may know that you had an incident um, in South Bend uh, with Eric Logan. I want to talk about Eric and find out more about um, Eric's life, um, how it impacted your community. And I also want to hear more about um, uh, what you've done since then, um, how you engaged the mayor, Mayor Pete at the time, and really also hopefully hearing a bit from you guys about how we can heal as communities, how other communities that are experiencing um, this trauma, police violence, vigilante violence, how can we heal and move past and, and what can we do to make sure that these things aren't happening to us um, again and again. Anyway, so thanks again for being here. And first, I'd love to hear a bit about um, how you started uh, BLM uh, South Bend. Yeah, thank you uh, for having us for having us here. Um, so we originally formed uh, back in the fall of 2016 around um, another case of, of officer misconduct. Um, there was a 17 year old young man named Sean Franklin, who was uh, beaten and tased in his sleep in his own home and bed um, back in 2012. Uh, the officers were not properly reprimanded. I think they were just suspended for a few days um, from the force. Uh, one of those officers was Aaron Nepper, who has a long history of misconduct. And he was actually involved in the Eric Logan um, case as well. He, um, he loaded his body into the, to the back of the car and drove him to uh, the hospital. Um, so we, we came together around Deshaun Franklin's case um, because in the, uh, the summer of 2016, a federal grand jury had ruled um, in favor of the family, um, had acknowledged that their civil and constitutional rights had been violated by the South Bend Police Department, uh, but that uh, grand jury only um, awarded them with uh, $18 total in compensation for the entire family. And so um, that case caught national, national news. Um, we got a little buzz around that as well. Uh, we were out protesting. We started a campaign called uh, Fire Aaron Nepper. Um, we knew that we couldn't actually get him fired off the force, but we wanted to press city officials and Mayor Pete Buttigieg at the time uh, to really work towards holding police officers accountable so that we don't have uh, these kinds of cases of misconduct. Um, and you mentioned Eric Logan, which I think a lot of people may be familiar with that case. Um, can you tell us a bit about Eric and what happened uh, in that moment? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can say a little bit about that. Uh, so early in the morning, July 16th, Father's Day, um, Eric Logan, he was leaving his, um, his family's home, uh, walking down the street. Apparently there were some calls made, it was late in the night, um, I believe around like 4 a.m. Um, there were some calls made alleging that there was a, a black man um, burglarizing vehicles um, in the area. And uh, the officers approached him in a, in a parking lot, pulled up on him, and they claimed that he was brandishing a knife and was charging, coming towards them, and uh, which prompted them to shoot him. And when they uh, shot him, they alleged that he threw the knife and it hit the officer and the officer shot him again, fatally, ki fatally killing him. So we, um, when that happened, um, you know, the family was obviously uh, devastated. And um, later that night, um, the, well, the following night, because this was early in the morning at 4 a.m. when it happened, but later that night, um, uh, Mayor Pete had called for a press conference with the president of the city council, uh, Tim Scott, and uh, chief of police, Scott Ruskowski. Um, 
as that as that uh, that press conference was forming and buzz was was um, you know happening online or around this shooting, um, I had reached out to the family. I just found you know found his wife um, online because Subin's a small town. So more than likely, if you search for you know a name on Facebook, you'll likely find a common or mutual mutual friend. Mm -hmm. So I was able to find his wife. I messaged her. Said, hey, you know. I'm an organizer here, saw what happened, want to lend my support, you know, how can we help? She said they're calling for a press conference, can you be there? Um, I went down there and it was, it was truly a tragic scene. We were on the, um, we were on the 14th floor, uh, which is where uh, the mayor's office is. And the family was um, allowed to come up, um, but not allowed to be in the room with the mayor. So they were in a separate room. So while Mayor Pete is on um, local news, speaking to the situation the family is in uh, another room probably just 200 feet away um waiting for answers the mayor never acknowledged them he never came and met with them or spoke with them and they had a lot of they had a lot of questions and so when the um when the press conference uh wrapped up they demanded that that they you know be able to speak with uh mayor pete and they were met with him um, very briefly. They asked him a couple questions. They didn't like what they heard. And so they, they walked out and they were um, understandably upset. And what's interesting about that is um, when, we, when we left, when we were out in the hallway getting ready to leave the county city building, which is where the mayor's office is, 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 is housed, um, Eric Logan's brother, um, Tree, said, I'm telling you right now, watch though when when they go to pull the camera yeah the, the footage it will not exist his camera will not be on watch so this was before, that's exactly what happened so right so you hadn't you didn't even know at that point that the camera that there was no uh, body camera footage right no. exactly yeah when yeah. you heard when you heard about this you know what, what prompted you to call the family did you find this story did you were you did you feel like there were holes in the story or because I feel like we always hear like there's a knife there's a cell phone there's a this there's a construction site. like there's always some kind of reason did you did you find that tell a little bit about the history of relationship and the disconnect between police and black folks in South Bend like what was it that made you feel like this is I need to get down I need to talk to people. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I have experience um, in, in doing this kind of organizing work. Um, and so I, I understand that it's very important that you build a relationship with the family um, before you do anything, right? So I, I, I reached out to her, I was there, showed my support. And I saw a lot of comments online um, where folks were saying, you know, 5'9", like he's not known to have a knife, you know, maybe a gun, <laughs> you know, but, but certainly, certainly not a knife. And so just seeing the community's reaction to that, um, how, seeing how heartbroken folks were, I knew that we had to do something. So that's why I acted as quickly as I could and tried to um, get to the press conference and to be there with the family and to offer any support that, that I could. Yeah. Yeah, so after you found out there was no body camera footage, and, and you also talked a bit about the community and how folks were feeling. When people found out that there was no footage to really corroborate any of the stories, what was the reaction? Anger. People here don't trust the South Bend police uh, because of decades of, of misconduct. Mm -hmm. Decades of misconduct. Um, there have been uh, other um, officer-involved uh, murders uh, among Black folks here. Um, there was a case of Michael Anderson in uh, 2012, uh, where he was being uh, chased by a police officer um, for whatever reason. And when the officer caught him, uh, he alleged that Michael Anderson shoved a, 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 a several bags of drugs <laughs> down his throat and tried to swallow them. And the officer, um, in, in trying to save his life, um, allegedly uh, stuck a, a straw down his throat. And Michael Anderson ultimately died. We had no video camera footage, right? There was no dash camera footage, no body cams at that time. And so there was lots of questions. And so the relationship between Black folks and the police here is incredibly strained. Um, and, and that's probably made most evident by the police tape scandal, which was in national news and followed Pete along his uh, campaign trail. Uh, because those tapes 
uh, apparently contain um, uh, conversations between officers talking about how they would set up black folks, how they would conspire with the prosecutor to make sure black folks were locked up. Um, they were planning drugs on, on suspects. So uh, we, we knew we had to we knew we had to respond to this because this is something that the entire community was going to pay attention to. Um, we knew that this was going to that this was going to take off like wildfire. And when you have those moments um, where uh, black folks are paying attention and they're demanding justice, you, you got to be there. You got to be there. You got to show up uh, to provide direction. Right. Yeah. And and so what happened next in the Eric Logan case after you found out there was no body cam footage, the community was upset. How did you step in, in, with, in by supporting the family and the community? What steps did you take in order to make sure this was rectified? So, you know, obviously the first thing that we did was uh, show support um, to the family, just if they had any needs. So, um, helping them through just the grieving process, um, trying to help them find an attorney, which they were able to um, ultimately retain uh, someone. Uh, but also they, they wanted his name to stay in the news. They didn't want this to get swept under the rug. So, you know, we had a series of protests. We, we disrupted uh, a, a national press conference that Pete Buttigieg was having uh, um, at a local high school here. May I, may I intervene? Because I think we, we meant, missed some intricate details uh, right after uh, the death of Eric Logan. Um, after, of course, there was a memorial at the site. Um, then after uh, we had a sit down with uh, Mayor Pete when uh, Black Lives Matter LA um, came to um, get us organized, to show us what organizing looks like um, on that scale. Um, so then after um, Black Lives Matter, South Bend and L.A., um, both sat down, had a meeting with Pete, um, and Jordan Emanuel was there, um, and they could speak more to that because I think that's the most uh, powerful point of the movement um, when it came to um, how we were going to uh, overcome the obstacles that we overcame. So the meeting with Mayor Pete needs to, um, we need to talk about that. Jordan, yeah. and I wasn't there, so you and Manuel can uh, touch base on that. Yeah, so Jordan and I, we had a meeting uh, with Mayor Pete. And how did and that meeting come about? Did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? How did you get that meeting? We reached out to them, isn't that correct? Yeah, 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 we, re we reached out um, to him because, and this, this, is, this is why the, uh, the disruption at the press conference is important. Yeah, uh, because when we when we disrupted that, obviously there was a lot of emotions. The community came out full force um, and just really hammered him. Well, at the end of that press conference, um, he actually told a lie. He said, well, I've been reaching out to these folks like us activists, but no one has has came to meet with us. And that was a, that was a complete lie. Like he had never he had never reached out to us. So realizing that now he was sort of open to some kind of conversation we decided okay well let's let's engage him we obviously have his feet to the fire he's trying to save face he's on uh, you know he's on the uh, presidential uh, campaign trail right now so let, let's engage him and let's see if we can get some concessions right like let's see if we can get him to sign on to a special prosecutor let's see if we can get him to um equip our, our our body cameras with the right with the right technology um, but man, you can say more about that. I just want to make sure that yeah. you know, understood how we got to the point where we met with Mayor Pete. Yeah, so so we came to him with a uh, with a list of demands. We had about four four different demands. It was called for the immediate removal of uh, of the of the of Officer O'Neill from of, from his position. Um, it was about um, um, having uh, Chief Ruskowski, um get fired as well as um, in charge um, overseeing this police department who has been complicit in the amount of violence that is happening to black and brown bodies historically. Um, we called for um, the, the, their, their judicial body, the Board of Public Safety, for the, those members to be removed to, um, from their position um, for their dereliction of duty as well. And then we also called for implicit bias training uh, within the police department and also data. We wanted to be data driven in the work that we were doing. So what information did they have about the implicit bias um, within the police department? And there was, um, a, there was a test too, uh, the IDI. 
the cultural competency test as well that we that we asked for that went just be that went that went beyond just calling for train implicit bias training. And what is that? Right. Yeah, so it's the intercultural development uh, inventory. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a, a, a cultural competency test that's used nationwide. Uh, we had a, a, a member who uh, uh, who is a trained administrator for that test, and uh, she has used it in her work with teachers and principals. And it's a way of gauging uh, where you know folks are in terms of their understanding of of different cultures and different and folks of different backgrounds. And so what we wanted to do is, again, try to get a gauge as far as, okay, where's the police department as an aggregate in, um, in their cultural competency? And at first, um, Mayor Pete was incredibly reluctant to say that. And then um, Jordan and I, um, when we talked to him, said that we're not here trying to dig in people's HR files because that's the reason why he said that we couldn't look at them because, I mean, it's, it's in their HR files. Those are locked away. Um, and, and we find that this is what Mayor Pete has been about. He hides behind bureaucracy when he doesn't want to do something. Um, so he's saying, oh, there's, there's red tape. I can't, um, we can't open up these um, HR files. And so our solution we propose is that we don't want information on individual uh, people. We want to see if is there a culture of um, a lack of cultural competency within the police department, which relies, which looks at aggregate of information rather than individual officers and then he was finally like well um okay yeah we'll do that because we we've we don't really espouse to this bad apple sort of idea there's a bad cop here bad cop here but it's a culture that's complicit in allowing these bad apples to really um uh, do their 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 dirty work that that, that they're doing so we want to address yes we want to get bad officers out there but we also want to address the culture hence why we wanted to get what is the whole department looking at in terms of cultural competency so he gave us information on who to to go to um um, in terms of define that information and so I had a meeting with this person um, her, 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 I'll just say her name her name is Christina Brooks um, um, she's in she's not in that position anymore and we had and it took forever for me to get a meeting with her it took some strong arming by um, tactical CCing people on different emails to make sure that it said hey the mayor promised that we could have this information and so I finally had the meeting with um, with her and um, with her um, her associates and it, she promised that we could I could have access and use my role as a researcher to have access to the information to craft this data set in order to understand what is cultural competency look like in the police department um, I said everything was great. She was going to give me some paperwork to sign up. Um, I mean, the end of the story is pretty obvious. I hadn't heard back from her about this um, at all since. And so, um, so we see this pattern of people getting, trying to get black folks, particularly activists that are actually wanting to do something in the community, really tied up in these bureaucratic structures. And then they get lost and almost fade away into an abyss. And so there's this pattern that we've seen over and over and over and over with Mayor P and his associates that, um, that we said that we can't stand for this anymore and um, we have to, to act and do something about it. But again, another example, we have four demands and none of them were, um, um, were taken seriously and none of them actually happened. And the one that we had the closest one to, to getting, um, he made sure and tactfully had that get lost amongst the bureaucracy. Right, okay, so after you, were able to meet with Mayor Pete, provided these demands, demands unmet, then what happens? So then after there was a town hall, um, and Jordan could speak to that because I wasn't even in the scene yet. So there was a town hall right after that, Jordan? But that, town, that town hall is the one I spoke about earlier. That was before, that was before. we actually met with Mayor Pete. Mm -hmm. So that that's what, opened the door for us to because he said that he had reached out to us um in the past which was a lie and so um right yeah then we we met with him but we continue to go to um to the meetings so like the city council um were having public meetings and people came to that to hear about 
what the city council was going to do in response to the shooting. So there were community action group meetings, there were board of public safety meetings, and that's how we, that's how a cat came into the work. We actually went to a, a city council meeting and she had came like, you know, I'm just seeing what's going on online and I want to, I want, I want to get, uh, I want to get involved. You know, so I've been it's, important. it's important that people understand. So there are weekly meetings that happen that are, that are, meetings that are happening with bureaucratic offices, groups that, that are serve the community that are coming together and they are public. Right, right. right. These yes. are public meetings. And so when something happens, if you're in your community, you need change, you need to change material conditions, you attend these meetings. Right, exactly. And, and you have a voice during these meetings and you can say, this is what is necessary, this is what's happening, this is what we don't like, right. this is what you must change. And so that's what you're talking about. Those are the types of meetings that you started attending frequently exactly. around this topic, around these demands in order to move them along and then and then Kat became involved, got it. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then they had, oh, oh, Kat, do you wanna go ahead? So yeah, I just kind of want to speak to um, the uh, act community action meetings that they were having, mm -hmm. um, the community forums that they were having. Um, so we, Black Lives Matter facilitated as well as attended just about all of those meetings. Um, we watched the attendance dwindle uh, as we started to learn um, in these meetings. These advisory meetings were conducted for um, the community to show sympathy towards the officers. Um, it wasn't geared at all toward the victims of uh, police brutality. So here we are sitting in these meetings um, trying to bring justice um, to Eric Logan's situation. And as Manuel said, they'll keep activists uh, busy, you know, so one hand uh, doesn't know what the under, other has, you know, in store for it. So here we are busy. Um, I think there were seven, eight meetings. Um, relentlessly at these meetings and nothing came of it um, but all the scenarios that these meetings were geared towards sympathizing with uh, the police um, so we sat in those meetings and um, we, we thought that we were bringing justice to Eric Logan's um, situation you know his family you know trying to figure out so what are the solutions you know we're giving our open and honest opinions um, we also had to address the police because they were showing up um, with guns, um, you know, and here we are at a community forum because of police brutality and, you know, they're trying to be very persuasive and, um, you know, making sure that people don't show up because they're making them uncomfortable, you know, so no one's, so we're seeing the, the tendency dwindle down. Um, so then after we move into, um, other actions, you know, so what, is, what else is it that needs to be done to bring justice, uh, which brought us to um, asking for the resignation of uh, Mayor Pete's uh, administration. Um, we, we, we felt that after diving into uh, data, we, we felt that his record was a, a failed attempt to, you know, his constituents here in South Bend. And, um, we thought it would be most imperative to ask for uh, his uh, resignation um, uh, through, you know, uh, media um, so that everyone would know that um, we're not going to just sit back and allow, uh, you know, our leaders to pretend as if they're um, trying to solve problems. Um, and we know that definitely uh, the problems still exist now so we know any of those attempts uh never were seen through to yeah. bring justice yes and yeah. and, and the the timing became incredibly dire especially when mayor Pete's running for president he's saying he has this complete black support there's these black leaders within the community that completely support who he is while at the same time i mean Pete has a black problem in town and he is not telling the true story. So we wanted to be that voice. There needed to be a voice to step up and say, you cannot co-opt our black pain and move it to the side like everything is okay. So somebody needed to, to, to say something. Um, this is at the, the same time that he was coming out with his Douglas plan. This, I mean, this beautiful plan about how he was gonna fix black America 
but when there are structural issues, issues by design that are happening in South Bend, that that Douglas plant has not seen the light of day, even in the own in our own town. So who is he trying to say that everything is okay, like this is Camelot, when there is structural issues that are happening that he is just ignoring? And this was our opportunity to say, you can't use Black people, and especially you can't use Black people in South Bend, Indiana. And what you're talking about is so important because you, what you're talking about is holding people accountable and holding and not just thinking that you vote for someone or that you, you are just, a, you have to take what you get. You're holding people accountable for what they say, for the role that they have, and for their responsibilities to all of their constituents. And so how, it, it, so I, I hear that you know, you call for Mayor Pete's resignation right when he was running for president. So there was that opportunity to hold him accountable. How, tell us a little bit more about that and how that went and where you showed up and all of this accountability. Can, can I just say, can, let me say something about that real quick, Kat, um, mm -hmm. because Kat actually is the person who called for his resignation um, in, in, in the local media. Um, the reason why we called for that is because when we met with him, we actually had a discussion about these community action group meetings, right? So these meetings were, they were really supposed to be something that was unprecedented, right? It was supposed to be this increased um, um, transparency where, where the city was uh, opening and the police department and the, and the Board of Public Safety uh, was opening itself up for scrutiny, right? So they had these meetings allowing for citizens to come and actually look at police department policies and procedures and weigh in on what needed to be changed, right? So we thought, okay, this is great, right? Like we, we protested, we held disruptions, right? We had a 24 hour um, uh, essentially standoff outside of the county city building. And now Mayor Pete is saying, hey, I'm hearing what y'all are saying. Like, let's have these meetings. Let's talk about these policies, right? So when we met with him, we said, okay, will you be at these meetings? And he said that he was going to be at some of the meetings, but every meeting we went to, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't there. He didn't show up. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're here, we're participating. Like Kat said, they're centering, they're giving us these scenarios and they're centering the pain and the experiences uh, and the trials of officers, but nothing about community members who are impacted by uh, police officer misconduct. So over time, we saw that the attendance started to dwindle, but we understood that it was important that we still maintain and held that space, that we still uh, maintain our presence and had a voice and a say in, 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 the, in the larger dialogue, right? Um, I mean, the meetings were, were so bad that some of the facilitators didn't even show up. And that's how Emmanuel became a facilitator because <laughs> the facilitator that at his, for his group didn't even show up. And so they were like, well, can you facilitate? And so then he took that on. So we knew these, these meetings were a farce and they were just a way of, of making him look good. Yeah. And so when we called for his resignation, you know, more reporters started like asking like, okay, what's going on? Like, you know, how has he, how has he responded? Why are you calling for his resignation? And we just let them know like, yeah, he's going around the country bragging about, you know, these, these community action group meetings that are taking place, but he hasn't even shown up to one. So Kat, what, what was you just, how did you do it? Tell us how, what that is like to call for your mayor's resignation. How did you do that? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's terrifying, you know, um, because we live in a small city. Um, so you instantly know that there's going to be some kind of backlash. At least you prepare yourself mentally um, for that backlash um, and the repercussions, you know. Um, so for me, it was something that, had to be done. Um, we were at a point where we weren't being taken seriously. Um, and I think that um, P just thought that it was gonna be easy to get rid of us and we would just go away. Um, so things had died down a little bit in the city um, regarding um, the death of Eric Logan. And um, so we wanted to make sure that um, P didn't think for a minute that this was over, you know? So um, asking for his resignation for me was um, the most terrifying thing to do, but um, I know that, you know, this is our duty. Um, if we plan on getting any kind of um, results or resources um, allocated to our community, 
um, that's the reason why we're fighting, you know, and it's, it's, it's as terrifying as it was, I, I wasn't going to back down from it. Um, it was a, my duty. So I seen it through. And how did you do that? Did you call for his resignation in the press? Did you send a letter? Yeah, we sent out a press release and um, we met up with the media. And it, the reason why it was just so uh, terrifying because Pete is looked at as like a, a small time hero. Like he's our, most people's local hero. So um, I remember my neighbors, you know, approaching me, you know, saying, you should be ashamed of yourself. You single handedly um, dismantled. Um, his presidency, and I said, you know, I can't take credit, like, I'm with the organization, like, you know, Pete dismantled his own, you know, political career, you know, by not meeting the needs of the community, you know, and, and so I, I lived in my house, you know, sometimes not sleeping, uh, just fear, you know, uh, you know, the consequences of doing that, um, but like I said, I, I was committed. I'm, I've been committed um, to the cause. Um, it's not about me. It's bigger than me. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, he wasn't he wasn't present here. So while the community is in turmoil, he's around the country campaigning and still getting paid by the citizens of South Bend. So we're like, well, why are we paying you to go and campaign when your community here is has been deeply affected? by this death and you're nowhere to be found. You're around the country talking about what's happening in South Bend, but you're not here. You're not showing up. Yeah. And so we wanted to send a message to him because he really thought that things had sort of like died down, that they had it un under control, they were having these meetings. We said, no, we want him and the country to know that he's problematic and he, he really need, he, he just needs to go. Right, right. And, and what's the, the ripple effect of, of this and, and this moment and being able to call for Mayor Pete's resignation and holding him accountable for the death of Eric Logan and his inactivity and his um, not meeting demands and not giving this the attention that it requires. What's, what's the big impact that this has um, or the, the, either the impact or the hoped impact that this has in your community and what can others learn from this? I think for, for me, the, the, the word that I heard the most often at the, um, the community action group meetings um, before people started or people stopped coming was the word accountability. And we want to put all of our politicians on notice. If you don't do your job, we will come and get you. Um, and, and that's exactly what we want to do is that you are called to be public servants. You are our, we are your boss. And um, and if and if you don't take your job seriously, um, we we will make sure that you are well known um, for your inability to do your job, and we we will hold you accountable um, as the people are, have been calling for. So us taking on Pete as the Goliath around here, <laughs> uh, it it shocked a lot of people because he was this rising star in the Democratic Party, right? Like. You know, he's this Harvard, you know, Road, Harvard minted Rhodes Scholar um, who went from small town mayor to major uh, presidential contender. And so for folks to see us here locally take him on, it, it, we got a lot, we have a lot of enemies. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> there's a lot of people who don't like us, but also at the same time, there's a lot of people in power who are afraid of us because they're like, well, if they can do that to him, what can they do to me? So anytime that there were like public meetings, there would be a word going out like, oh my gosh, Black Lives Matter might, might, might show up. Like, we just want to make sure that nobody comes and disrupts the meeting. We don't want a whole bunch of commotion. And that's not, you know, yeah, we disrupt, but you know, when we disrupt, we come with facts. I mean, we are, you know, we have substance to us. We're not just screaming and yelling. You know, we are pointing out gaps in policies and procedures. Um, so, I mean, we do our, we do our due diligence. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point because as you clearly articulated, there are very specific, logical, reasonable, necessary demands that you put forth. And it's not, it, 
it, they are not being heated. And what, once they are not heated, once the people in power are not doing their job by having conversations as promised and just pretending like it's not happening, what else is there to be done? but a louder noise. Right. And right. It, and it is the way that the pendulum has to swing. We have to move. That's how you have, that's how you dismantle the systems that are built around uh, white privilege and white supremacy. We must dismantle those. And in order to do that, we have to amplify our voices and build power. And so it's a very, very good point and to, to, to mention or to make sure people understand that it is not chaos, it is strategy. Right. Um, it is not noise. It is movement. It is right. building. It is power. It is really accessing what we need as a community to get to be acknowledged as human beings. It is reclaiming humanity. Anything else around that? And, and, and Mayor Pete, Mayor Pete is he's he's you know he's a smart guy and he really understands identity politics. And so um, he had put these. Really was really good about putting these um, certain folks in place to sort of insulate himself from any kind of real criticism, right? So I, we've mentioned the Board of Public Safety here, just so folks know, the Board of Public Safety um, is a, a, a five-person body that uh, oversees police discipline, um, disciplinary matters, uh, training, hiring, firing, and promotions. And all of those folks are appointed by the mayor. And that's and that's um, that's state law. So there's nothing that we could do on a local level to change that. That is set by the state of Indiana. Okay. Well, when Mayor Pete would face his criticism of, well, why didn't why didn't you form a, a citizens review board? Why didn't you um, respond to the concerns of minorities? Well, he'll say, well, we do have a citizens review board. We do have a board of public safety, and it's actually majority minority. So because there are three black men um, on this board of public safety. He can say, well, I, you, I made sure that the, the Board of Public Safety was, was d diverse, that they're community leaders. And so I, I did what, what I could do. I can't, I, can't, uh, I can't make them hire, fire, or reprimand an officer in any, in any kind of way. All I can do is make an appointment. But that is your power. Your power is in your appointments and your removals. That's right. That is right. Yeah. So what's happening now? So what is, uh, what's BLM South Bend focusing on now? Um, Mayor Pete is obviously out of the race. Um, it, it, what, what's going on now and what's next? Yeah. Um, yeah, so right now uh, we have our expungement series going on, um, just working on the people in our communities, um, trying to make a, a, them uh, a space um, to be able to work, um, ha receive housing. Um, also, uh, we're going to uh, next be launching our um, uh, driver's license uh, renewal program, um, <clears throat> and just trying to work forward um, toward more of a trauma-informed community. Um, yes, uh, you guys have anything else to add? Yeah, it's something that we've um, been in the works on is starting um, a part of our organization called Black Queer Lives Matter and realizing that uh, people experience intersecting traumas and intersecting experiences of, of domination through at, at different levels. So again, providing a space for people that identify within those communities to specifically have a space where they can get some respite and reprieve and also some power building within um, those individuals as well. And we're, and we're still pushing for police accountability. So mm -hmm. um, because of our work, uh, the uh, Board of Public Safety um, and uh, the legal department of the city of South Bend had, is looking towards adopting a police discipline matrix, which it has never had. So it's never really had a standard or a process for removing officers who engage in misconduct. Um, so uh, that's on the table now, and uh, they've put a, a, a draft forward, and we've uh, offered co uh, comments on it. We've been at uh, action community action group meetings around it. And then also, we've been working with a, a city councilman named Henry Davis Jr., who has a, a long history of pushing for police accountability dating back to 2012. Uh, when he called for body cameras, when he called for a citizens, a real citizens uh, review board. And, and now um, 
almost, you know, seven years later, uh, we are um, in the process of actually getting a, a, a police complaint board that is uh, uh, essentially staffed by, by citizens um, on the books here in South Bend. So this is uh, it's a critical time for us right now. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, that held up a lot of our work. Um, but we are, you know, still pursuing justice for for Eric Logan, and we are still looking to hold police officers accountable here in South Bend. And what advice would you give to other communities, particularly now, where there's a lot of communities who are currently in trauma? What advice would you give to organizers and people, and families that are affected? Let's say hold each other extra tight. I mean, in this period of mayhem and trauma, I think it's easy to lash out at the person standing next to you. Um, but to realize that we are collectively struggling together and that we're all in this together. And as somebody might feel hurt, um, know that the person next to you is feeling hurt too. And so to engage in radical acts of love. It's beautiful. Definitely. Also, I mean, I, I, I give them this piece. I'd say to them that um, this battle that we're fighting, you know, it's been fought before, you know. Um, we're still at a point where we're asking people to be civil um, and um, it's not going to, they're not going to give us, you know, um, it's not going to be handed over. We're going to have to take it um, and, and, and until we can um, make sure that we can unite as one person, you know, we have to find a way to be more uh, patient with one another um, and meet people where they are. Right. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's we're, we're all in this together. And um, I want them to understand that this is the time for accountability. You have to have accountability at your house. You have to have accountability in your community and you definitely have to have hold these leaders accountable. That's their duty. And I think we need to frame the conversation um, different. This is, we are in a civil rights movement right now, and we need to own that, that we are in the midst of a movement. We don't have to look back to Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, back in the 50s and 60s at, at a movement, but we are in the midst of so many issues that need to be solved right now. And I think if we can hold that up and to say we are in maybe a global civil rights movement, maybe a new civil rights movement, then maybe that will give us the, the impetus and the, and the sort of collective reminder of what it takes to actually make things happen. Oh yeah, Kaylee, I, I thank you for um, allowing this to happen and organizing this, Queen. Uh, but I think it's important to put on record that um, our efforts um, couldn't have been uh, as successful as they have been if it hadn't been for uh, other grassroots organizations that um, came to our aid, you know, that believed in us, that believed in what we we're doing. Um, we have bullets for life. Um, we have uh, food, not bombs. Um, these people, uh, uh, we have uh, Mr. Fix-It Ford. Um, these people came to our aid and assisted us, um, helped us to feed the community 24 hours at the 24-hour standoff. Uh, these people have Whatever we've asked of them, um, they've been so accommodating. We're blessed to, um, in South Bend to have these grassroots organizations that see the oppression um, and, and, they, and they stand with us. You know, um, even when we were traveling, um, we were um, in Iowa, you know, uh, and we're disrupting, you know. It was Palestinians that stood with us, you know. So we have, and we have to be, um, make sure that um, uh, nationally we organize, as we organize, that we uh, thank those people that helped us along the way. Yes, very important. Well, thank you all. Um, how can people follow your work? How can people get more information? How can people help? Yeah, so they can they can uh, follow us on uh, Facebook, uh, Black Lives Matter uh, South Bend. Um, they can also follow us on Twitter, BLM, um, our at sign BLM South Bend, or they can email us at blm.southbend at gmail uh, com. Um, we are we're we're, we're very active uh, here locally. We're we're um, attending events and doing things on a on a weekly basis. 
And so if, if folks want to learn how we do what we do, they can reach out to us or if they want to, um, you know, get involved here locally, uh, we welcome them. I might I add, you know, like this job and the scale of work um, is tremendous, you know, um, and, and the way that we organize, we need resources. So if anyone, you know, is able to donate to us, you know, that's how we keep running. Um, so definitely all donations are accepted and appreciated. You can also reach the South Bend team through blacklivesmatter.com on the chapter page. You can reach the South Bend team that way as well. Um, and great. Thank you so much, uh, Kat. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan, for, ev for being here and just for everything that you do. And uh, we hold you and we uplift you and uh, we, we are internally grateful for the work that you're doing for our people. We thank you for your inspiration and your creativity um, and, and your work because um, it's hard. I know it's hard. It's very, very hard. So again, thank you so much, um, each of you, and appreciate this time that we got to spend together. Thank you.